Hi, everyone. My family, you're all here. How's it going? This thing is weird. Okay. Sorry, Pastor, I bent your microphone. So, here I am. Um, I got a teaching for you and me and anyone who wants to receive it. And the name of the teaching is Deal With Your Demons First. So, before anyone gets mad at me or offended, just know that I had to deal with demons before I could get here that were attacking me to try to make me freak out about having to teach in front of everyone. So, that was, you know, the motivation behind this. And um, the bottom line is we're sent to a deliverance ministry. So, in order to qualify to be here, you got to have demons or you wouldn't get sent here. So it shouldn't really blow people away when people act like they have demons that come here, you know? So we're going to learn a little more about that and um, how to deal with our demons first so then we can help people. So um, it's time to put the devil under our feet. You'll either have your foot on his neck or he's got his foot on your neck. There is no in-between. Jesus came to destroy the devil's dominion over you and we're ordered to take authority and move him out. The devil only affects us by our own permittance or our own permission. If you turn to Luke 10, 19. It says... Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Everyone see that? The truth of God's word will either lead you to repentance or to rebellion. And this is called true ministry, so there's a lot of truth here, if you haven't noticed. Um, Exposure to truth doesn't guarantee freedom, though. It, It guarantees you a choice. You have a choice to follow truth or follow the wrong voice. This is why you can go through a nine-month program here and go back right to the same thing. And the problem really is you don't even just go back to the same thing. You go back so it's worse than you were. So if you, um, you don't have to go there, but in 2 Peter 2.20, it verifies that. Um, go ahead and go to Romans 2.13. So like I said, hearing the truth or being exposed to the truth doesn't guarantee freedom just by hearing it. It guarantees you a choice to follow it. So in Romans 2.13, it says, For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Then it goes on to say, For the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, These all, though not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and believing themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So your conscience is where you receive conviction. It is your given protector from God. Once your conscience is exposed to the truth and you continually choose not to obey it, your conscience becomes seared and you'll end up in a worse state than you were in the first place. Conviction is a gift from God and we're supposed to run toward it, not away from it. And God knows what you're accountable for and what you have comprehended and chosen either to obey or ignore. Your conscience is where the spirit of conviction speaks to you and we are to be checking in there before we make any decisions and keep an ear out for it and take heed when it speaks to you. In 1 Timothy 4, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, 
giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy and having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. People are dying and going to hell every day. There's actually about 10 people that I can name off the top of my head that have gone through total freedom here and left in the wrong kind of way and ended up dying. And, it, you know, it's not for me to say they went to hell. I would never say that because that's not my place to say. But it didn't look so good, um, you know. And when you, like, how many chances do you think you have of grace before you, it runs out? It's serious. Um, when you die, you, what do you want to leave? A legacy of a righteous man or woman of God? Or do you want to leave your family and children wondering if you went home or not? So it's serious. You know, you get sent here. People don't come to a nine-month program because everything's going great. Adults decide to come to a nine-month program because there's nothing else. They've tried everything else. No one else was able to help them, and they're desperate. And then once we get here, we learn some things in class and continue on. And, you know, the amount that we keep, that we've received, should be as much as possible, not just, like, pick and choose a few things and keep it moving because we're eternal beings one way or another if you have a spirit and you have a soul your spirit is eternal where it goes is up to you but either way it's going to be eternal so as long as you're here on this planet and you have a soul you're going to be dealing with demons and it's not just to go through the class and go through deliverance and then keep it moving like i said you're going to be facing demons every day for the rest of your life and it's going to be your choice. Are you going to obey the voice of God or are you going to obey the voice of the stranger? <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you suppose he will be thought worthy who has trampled on the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? And that's what I mean when I say, how, how much grace do we have? We have to um, insult the spirit of grace. Like we're, we have abundant grace when you're walking, you know, doing your best to be pleasing to the Lord and do the right thing. Then you have unlimited grace. But grace to deliberately disobey and ca cast it aside and not do what you're supposed to do, that runs out. <laughs> If you're wimpy, you will not make it through this ministry. The devil will chase you out of here. He will talk you to and obeying the voices of your demons. And he's been trying to chase me out for going on 10 years, but I'm not moving. The devil will even make people think they're right in their error when they leave and that we're the ones that are crazy because that's what deception does. If you're ever going to be anything for God, you'll have to be tested and refined in the fire. We are promised a Holy Spirit baptism with fire. He needs to make sure that you know how to fight. If you're not willing to fight, how will you conquer? How will you overcome? What will you be able to teach? How can we teach someone else to stop listening to demons if we are still listening to ours? We have to deal with our demons first before anything else. If we don't deal with them, they will continue to interfere and cause chaos in our lives and those around us. They will make us a bad witness, use us against our brethren, and eventually cause us to give up and run back to the world. You cannot refine, um, bypass the refining process. The word says you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire, meaning it's a package deal. The Lord dwells with a pure heart, so we will be burning out the garbage inside of us until we make it home. 
If you're unable to discern the garbage inside of you, the devil will have you blaming everyone else around you for your own junk. Some of us are even able, unable to admit, unable to admit there is garbage in there, which is a very dangerous place to be. Um, one of the hardest things people have to do at Total Freedom is face the mirror, and it hurts to realize how disgusting and wretched as a man or woman we are just by human nature, not even specifically all of the things that we did before we got here, just in general. It's devastating and gut-wrenching. And unfortunately, from my observation of being here, as long as I have, most people are too chicken to do it and they leave and they miss God's plan for their life. They'll run back to carnality where they feel safe and comfortable and in it instead of dealing with their demons. Or, you know, some of us get stuck in re our discernment, like our religious discernment where we can discern what's going on with everyone else and we're constantly being offended or annoyed or, you know, bound up about someone else's choices, but we're not looking for what's going on with us. And I see that happen, uh, unfortunately. It's like, because you get so much knowledge in the classroom, you get so much knowledge from pastor that knowledge puffs you up. The word says that. So if you're only receiving part of what God's offering you, which is the knowledge, and you're not applying all the rest of the things that you're learning, then the knowledge will puff you up and you'll end up in a religious state, which is pretty miserable to watch too. Um, you know, we all can lean towards that because it's pride. We know a lot of stuff that most people don't know. People want to talk to us about God and you're like, yeah, you know about God. Okay. You know, the thoughts come because we've been blessed. God chose us to be here. He didn't have to do that, but he did. He thought you were significant enough to bring here and learn what he's teaching here. Um, focusing on self will never make you better. The world teaches self-help, but it leads to more bondage. Before you know it, you might even be on meds following their self-help and psychology and psychiatrists and counseling and blah, blah, blah. I mean, getting counsel is good, but there's a difference between biblical counsel and worldly counsel. We need to step out of self and discern what is us and what is the voice of the stranger. We must pay attention. It is our job to monitor our thoughts and discern where it is coming from. Because if you're not going to do it, who is? Focusing on self is being primarily concerned with how present situations going to affect you, your life, your comfort, what people think of you, your convenience, and things like that. Is this going to benefit me or cause difficulty? When you are focused on self, these are your number one priorities on how you deal with whatever you're facing that day. And every choice that you make is shaded with manipulation to try to make it convenient to what you want to achieve. And that opens the door because you're listening to the wrong voice. Righteousness is obtained through focusing on and monitoring our own thoughts and paying attention to see which voice we are obeying. We compare our thoughts to the character of Christ. In Matthew 16, 21... Now, you know, this is just to show that no one's exempt from this. I mean, this dude, Peter's hanging out with Jesus 24-7 and learning everything firsthand in contact with God Almighty for I don't know how long, but a very long time. And here it says, from, the, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this shall not happen to you. 
But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Peter was listening and speaking the voice of the stranger continually. Obeying the wrong voice leads to bondage, torment, jails, institutions, and even interfering with God's plan for your life and others. The voice of the stranger is the demons. They speak to you every day. They are assigned to your life. They're not your demons. They don't belong to you. But the question is, do you belong to them? It's time for us to get, grow up and get honest, get real and get free because this is called total freedom here. It's not total bondage. And that's what I tell people when they come into my office and they're all like in a tizzy. I'm like, what is this? This is total freedom. Why are you bound up? Be free. You have the choice. You got the tools. We all do. Just got to use them. Now, not later. Um, Ephesians 4.11 He gave himself, excuse me, he, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers. That's good news. He's talking about us. For the equipping of the saints and for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to be a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine or every goofy thought by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things to him is the, who is the head of Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causing the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So, you know, when even carnal teaching, teach, worldly teaching teaches, when you start using drugs or drinking addictively or, you know, you experience some traumatic abuse, a lot of the areas stop maturing mentally at that age. So when people come here, they may be excelling in great in certain areas, and then other areas they act like they're like 12, you know? And it's time for, we're here in a safe place to learn how to grow up in these areas and stop, stop it. Because life doesn't work out really good when you're adult and you get adult consequences. I mean, kids go to juvie or get some, you know, not big a deal consequence when they misbehave. But when adults do kid things, they go to big boy jail or prison and it's a lot worse. It sucks. Bad stuff happens. Your kids get taken away. Your family leaves you. You, you overdose and die. You, go, you know, things happen that are serious. Not that going to juvie is not serious, but the consequences are more severe and permanent. So, just to be clear, to grow up means to accept full responsibility for your life, for your choices and your behavior, the good, the bad, the ugly. No more blame game and justifying your bad decisions. That is what's childish and needs to grow up. We acknowledge and admit our mistakes and learn from them. I mean, you don't have to shout it from the rooftops, but we should be recognizing and acknowledging, okay, I could have did that better. I shouldn't have said that. You know, get your conviction, receive it, get with the Lord, repent, and move forward. Because when you don't do that, that's when your mind starts blaming everyone else. And now everyone else is driving you nuts and getting on your nerves. But really, it's you because you're listening to, you're not dealing with your demons. You're letting them deal with you. First John... 
Ready? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So there's three areas that we're tempted, right? Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. And everybody comprehends, knows, and understands the lust of the eye is not good. I mean, whether they follow it or not, we all get it that that is troublesome. And the lust of the flesh is even worse because you're actually taking action. But when it comes to the pride of life, I think, you know, we know and we learn that pride is bad, but I think maybe because it's the third one, we kind of just like skim over that and we don't really think about that the pride of life is something that God's warning us about that will take you out if you're not careful about it. So the pride of life is things like my social status, who I think I am, who I want others to think that I am, my image, all the stuff I know about everything, how I think people should treat me or talk to me, what my talents and abilities are, what my title is, what college or Bible school I went to, blah, blah, all that stuff. That is part of life. What kind of car do I drive? I, things like that. I mean, it's nice to have nice things, but when it's consuming your thoughts and your life and taking preeminence above your relationship with the Lord, it's dangerous. The fact that you are a child of God is the most valuable truth you will ever need. The devil will attack you with your own pride and arrogance. If the pride of life holds value in you, you won't stay free. The pride of life is a receptor for the voice of the stranger. The three ways man is tempted, the lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Temptation is essentially, what are we tempted to do? You're tempted to listen to the demons, obey the demons, listen to the voice of the stranger. That's what temptation is. Demons speaking to you, voice of the stranger speaking to you to tempt you to obey them instead of God's voice. We are tempted to obey the voice of the stranger continually all day, every day. The voice of the stranger speaks. We either keep it or cast it down. And it comes back. We're supposed to be paying attention to that. It's a lot easier to see when you do it and then everything's going bad, but we're trained here to, you know, first strike. That means you're um, on offense. The devil can only rule over his kingdom. Only if part of his kingdom in, is in you, then he can rule over you. That's how he makes con connection. Like the Holy Spirit makes connection when you let his spirit come dwell in you. When you have things that are evil dwelling in there, that's how the devil makes connection with you. Jesus told the devil, you have nothing in me. And that's what he's looking for us to be able to say to him too. Um, a lot of things that go on that the devil tries to use to distract us from what we should be doing or what's the purpose is it's like the devil's sideshow, like a false flag attack. Like it, I don't know if everyone knows, a false flag attack is, doesn't mean the event didn't happen, but it was created to detract from something major that they don't want you to focus on or like a sideshow at the circus. It's not the main event. It's got all this weirdo stuff going on. It's got your attention, but that's not what you were here for. So don't get caught up in it. Don't fight, fight non-essential secondary wars. Distractions waste time and cause you to miss God. First, we submit to God or obey his voice. And then we can res resist the devil, which pastor has said more times than I can count. But we can still go there anyway. 
James 4, 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then I like the little title here. It says, humility cures worldliness. Like, there's a clue right there. Um, <laughs> Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So, when you listen to the voice of the stranger frequently and try to listen to the Holy Spirit, that is what's double-minded. That's what it is. You got two things going on in there, two different minds, mind of Christ, mind of hell, and then your mind. So maybe it's triple-minded. I don't know. Um, getting too deep. <laughs> we are to cast down all thoughts and imaginations if you go to 2 Corinthians 10, 3. Alrighty. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Like I said, we cast down all thoughts and imaginations that exalt themselves. We send them back where they came from. We don't grab hold of them. And exalting itself means placing above the approval of God's word, it's justifying not obeying God's methods or instructions for some reason, whatever it may be, deviating from righteousness. So we're to cast down all thoughts that tell you to do things that obey anxiety or manipulate or fix or cover mistakes or lie or protect self or you do things out of order. We're, we're to cast these thoughts down. Why? Because those thoughts are demon-fed to you. And if you obey them, then you are obeying the demon who brought it and opening the door, not dealing with your demons. And these are, you know, this is all things that I've learned through being here. Just want to help you all out a little bit and help myself out too because I was refreshing myself with all these things. If you don't get these concepts down, you will never be able to be a leader you will get clobbered every time and get set up by your own demons. Why? Because you keep obeying them. Every one of us here should be able to be in a leadership position and follow divine order. But in order to follow divine order, first you have to get your mind in divine order. And if you're not um, dealing with your demons, then your mind is going to be all over the place and you're going to be tossed to and fro and you're not going to grow up and you're going to you know, probably come back after you leave. You know, not a good way. I mean, we welcome you back, of course, but have to go back through the program again. Um, open doors and voices to the devil present themselves every day. We don't deny it. We just repent when we miss it and be free. Nobody listens to the Holy Spirit 24-7, 365. Uh, the hope is at the end of the day, Holy Spirit ratio is higher, voice of the stranger lower. That's a good day. But there's nobody that's like, I always hear the Holy Spirit. If they do, then you know, yeah, don't listen to them. They don't know. They're not honest. They're not transparent. Um, the unseen spirit world runs on thought projection, which is like the projector. The devil puts thoughts in your mind and projects an image and you see it. We need our helmet of salvation because our mind needs to be saved every day. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, your spirit is saved, but your mind and your flesh is not saved. It needs to be renewed with the word of God. So we put this helmet of salvation on 
to keep and protect you from crazy because this world is crazy and they call good evil and evil good and it is getting worse and worse every day. It's like at the climax of evil good, calling good evil and evil good. And people think and treat you like you're crazy when you speak the truth of God in love and walking in righteousness. So you have to know who you are in Christ and if you're not dealing with your demons, then you're going to start questioning, you know, what you know, because you're not solid. You will see and hear things every day trying to corrupt your mind and bring you to compromise and lead you astray. Even music. I mean, driving down the street and people are blasting their music and the things that it says is so disturbing to me. And I mean, I didn't come from a G-rated past by any means. I was pretty ridiculous and unreserved. And it's just, it blows my mind. The music that's just on the regular radio or the commercials that I walk out. And if I had something that has a commercial on, my kid's watching something horrific on a commercial. You have to be so careful. It doesn't happen often, thankfully. I don't normally watch things that have commercials, but it, it has happened. And lo and behold, it's like some kind of weird Harry Potter commercial about some kid show with like witchcraft and stuff floating around. I'm like, whoa, it's crazy. We must ask the Lord to wash our soul and mind with his blood every day. Our mind needs to be saved through renewal and washing of his word, praise and worship every day. We go through life day in and day out collecting bitterness, offense, resentments, and ought. Unforgiveness is pretty obvious. And we've all learned a lot about unforgiveness. We choose to forgive because it's a command from the Lord. Bitterness is not always as obvious. It's like the subtle residue of unforgiveness that's left over in your soul. It's that little bit of yuck you have left over for a person even though you forgave them. It's like the bad taste they left in your mouth, so to speak, and it rises up when they are mentioned or if you have to deal with them. And um, it's an open door. Ought is a little, it's like a little notch that has been carved into your soul, a soul wound by that person. They morally failed you at some level. You're still holding something against them, a debt or a grudge. And because you're holding it against them, the wound is still there. You're not letting it go, not getting over it, so you're not getting healed. If you have a splinter, you have to get it out before it can be cleansed and healed. And I don't know but if you've ever experienced but some people freak out when you try to get a splinter out of them. Like They act like they're kicking and screaming and act like it's the end of the universe over a splinter. They rather let it stay in there and get infected than let you get it out. And some people's minds are infected with demons, and that's what happens when you listen to the voice of the stranger more than God. And God can heal you from ought and bitterness and unforgiveness, but we have to recognize that it's there and repent and allow ourselves to be healed so we can receive our full healing. And like I said before, this teaching is just as much for me as it is for you all, so don't think I'm up don't be getting ought and unforgiveness with me while I'm up here telling you about this because I would never come up here and say something that I, I'm not applying to my own life. Mark eleven twenty. It's just going to show you where it talks about ought. Mark eleven twenty. Hmm. Oh, it's 1125 typo. <clears throat> Mark 1125. Forgiveness in prayer. Maybe not. Now let's read the whole thing. 1120. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. 
And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And then it goes on to say, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. So to me, what that is saying is all of these cool things are going to happen to you. But if you, when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them that your father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. So if you're not forgiving them, then these things right before that probably ain't going to happen. And in the King James Version, it doesn't say it in the New King James Version, this anything against anyone that it talks about, that is ought. It says ought in the King James Version. So it's like a grudge or you're holding on to something and you're not letting God deal with it. Um, also in Matthew 5, 23, same type of thing here. Okay. I'm going to start at 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Rakos, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hands you over to the officer and you shall be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid every last penny or debt. So there where it says holding something against you, same thing in the King James Version, it says ought. So if you've done something wrong to someone and you know that you've hurt them and they're holding ought against you, we're supposed to do our best to make things right with them as well. The Lord can remove this ought from your soul and he's offering to do it, but if you don't let him, it won't happen you must choose to release the person and you must release the yuck. Let the Lord clean the demonic residue out of your soul. If you can't let it go, then ask the Lord to help you let it go because it will block you from having total freedom. Nothing from hell is too small. The smaller, the better in the eyes of the enemy. It's easier to be undetected. The person who abused you is not worth it. It doesn't matter anymore. Release them so you can be healed and delivered and set free. Amen? Amen. Matthew eighteen twenty two. So here's Peter again. says, then Peter came to him, Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin, ag sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. So I'm guessing like he was thinking that was a crazy amount, like seven times. But then Jesus blew his mind. He said, I did not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And don't get out your calculator because he's just speaking figuratively. It doesn't mean like 491, you don't have to forgive them. That's not, <laughs> that's not what he means. So, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that the payment be made. The servant therefore fell before 
fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. And that, when you get sent here, or even if you're blessed to come here and you didn't actually have to go through the program, but just being here, at some le level, your life was in a, a bad position where you were desperate and you needed the, to make things right with the Lord. And as your master, he wiped away your debts and forgave you and gave you grace. So we were forgiven. I mean, some, we have to reap for some of the choices we make, but it's far less than if you just continue out there doing the wrong thing. So in 27, the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him all his debts. But then that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, or however you say it. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saving, saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him in prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had the compassion on your fellow servants just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father will do to you if each of, or do if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother's trespasses. So in the New Testament, in the ministry of the spirit, being handed over to the torturers is the Lord lets the demons torment you because you're obeying them. So... Being offended is what a person is. They're tormented. Ought is the wound you are holding in your soul and not wanting to let it go. And bitterness is in your attitude. I'm calling it like the unforgiveness leftovers. You got to get this stuff cleansed out of your soul or you won't be healed fully and you won't be able to maintain your deliverance and you'll continually struggle. And you got to look out for it because, you know, we go through the class you go through emotional attachments. You write down all the people in your past, blah, blah, blah. But in the meantime, you're living at the house, creating new ungodly soul ties and offenses and bitterness and crazy things that happen. And you're starting all over again. So we need to continually monitor and realize this is forever. Like I said, you're eternal. As long as you're here on this earth, you're going to be dealing with this stuff. It's not just in the classroom or while you're on campus and not when you're at work or, you know, whatever. This is forever. You can either deal with it or it's going to deal with you. Um, in 1 John 1, 8 through 9, I'm almost done. In case you don't believe me, it says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the world is not, or the word is not in us. Amen? So the sin is the presence of evil, like Pastor teaches, which is the demonic voices tempting you to obey them. If you don't take offenses, you'll stay far ahead of the devil's plan for your life. If you choose not to take them when the de devil hands them to you, you just cast them down and smack them back to the pit where they came from. I read in a deliverance book, it's one of my favorite books, to picture the spirit realm, and there's like a, this is gross, bear with me. It's a, like roadkill, like a rotting carcass of flesh. And the demons are like buzzards, just they're so attracted to it and picking it and picking it off in a frenzy. And that's what happens when we allow the voice of the stranger to provoke us in the flesh. That's why everything starts irritating you more and more and more because that's what's happening to you in the spirit realm. 
If you're the type of person who is easily irritated, disturbed, or offended, the demons will keep sending people to do it. They will come at you from every direction because you are like golden corral to them, all you can eat. They will send people to text you. They will pop up on your Facebook. They will show up at your job. They will sit in your seat at church. They will cause your family to bring you up, bring up the past to you. Don't fall for it. You will stay bound and you will miss God. And we forgive and bless all of these people that do these things to us anyway, because God said so. And because they don't probably realize they're being used by the enemy. So you don't let it marinate. You don't think about it for two days. You just don't go there. Okay, that was from hell. I don't want it moving forward. We overcome evil with love. The love of God, which prevents us from going there, because in Corinthians where it talks about the word of God, oh, that's next. It says that love is not easily provoked. So love is a high priority and command of the Lord. We, when we are expressing his love towards others, we do this. Um, 1 Corinthians 13. Ready? Thir uh, Thirteen four. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in inequity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things endures all things. A love never fails. So, in other words, we put up with people and their goofiness. We love them anyway, even though it's annoying and inconvenient. And like I said, especially at the people that are at Total Freedom are a special breed. <laughs> You're one of them. So am I. So cut everyone a break. People are dealing with demonic torment. They are dealing with tragedies and devastations and traumas and mental illnesses and you know their brains fried sometimes they're not okay and they're loaded with demons so when a new person comes and everyone's like blown away because they're acting like this and they're doing this and they're wearing this and they didn't do this and and it's just I don't understand why everyone gets so blown away when that's what we do here. I mean, yes, you do have to follow rules, but from someone who currently has a four-year-old, you kind of repeat yourself a few times for them to get it. It's not just like, do this, done, and they're like, okay, because if they were able to do that, then they wouldn't have to go to a program if they were able to obey, you know? They need patience and love, and we need to remember what we were like when we got here because we forget the grace that was afforded to us and we need to have the same grace if not even more because maybe sometimes the way that we were treated by our house managers or whoever we didn't like it so much so why are we doing the same thing to someone else when we were sure complaining about it the whole time they were doing it to us but now you know treat people the way that you would like them to treat you and we'll talk about that in a minute Jesus loves everyone and desires no one to perish and you don't have to go there, but I'll read it to you. Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord is long-suffering for us, that we long suffer, and we long-suffer for his children, our brothers and sisters. The last part was me, not him. The Lord is long-suffering for us, and we long-suffer for his children our brothers and sisters. So he puts up with us and we put up with people even though it is inconvenient and you don't feel like it. I promise you, Pastor and Kate, don't feel like putting up with us every day of their life. They're not like, yay, I can't wait. They're like, oh God, again with this. I mean, they've been dealing with the same thing for 20-something years. And it's the same thing. Like this stuff I've all learned, but not necessarily from current events. This is pertains to now, but it pertained to a year ago and a year ago and a year ago. It, it's a, like my husband says, it's the same de demons, different people. Nothing new under the sun. So, you know, we all want and desire respect, 
But this is how you get respect. You show other people respect. Hold yourself to the same standard that you hold other people to and treat people the way that you would like to be treated or they're not going to respect you. Um, Matthew 7. And I've learned a lot of this stuff the hard way, so you don't have to because I just told you. It hurts. It's painful. Matthew 7, 3. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and tear you into pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And that's all of those who ask him anyone, not just the people we think deserve it. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So then it goes on to say, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So since that's directly following this, to me, it seems like it's a pretty big deal to God and how we treat people, and he knows that it's difficult, but he says difficult is the way that leads to life. We don't hate or mistreat people. We hate demons. When we as Christians mistreat people, we lead them away from the Lord, not to him. And it's demons are the ones with the problem. If someone's got anxiety, it's a spirit of anxiety. It's not them. If they have Anger, it's a spirit of anger. If they have profanity, it's a spirit of profanity. If they have cancer, it's a spirit of cancer. The person is separate from the symptoms of the demonic presence. The demon carries the symptoms. If you get rid of the demon, you get rid of the symptoms. So tell the person who told you that when they're listening to the wrong voice. Pray for them. Lord, I know so and so is struggling with fear. Pray for them, you know. I know so-and-so is struggling with lust. I've seen them looking at that person. Pray for them. That's what we're here to do. We're supposed to carry an anointing that scares the devil, not let him aggravate us into submission. I was taught by Kate here to sow mercy and reap mercy. And if you sow wrath, you reap wrath. You reap wrath. But there's just something about human nature. It just like wants people to get what's coming to them. But if you want to see, receive mercy and grace like abundantly, always, no matter what. But when it comes to someone else doing the wrong things, like you hope that, that that's what they get, you know? Yep, that's about time. What, <laughs> what's up with that? That's not the character of Christ. But it, that's, we should know that. Okay, that's not the character of Christ cut it out. And I mean, I, because I guess I'm in leadership, I see more, you know, people won't, they don't put, let me put it this way. When somebody wants someone to get in trouble, they won't come to me because they know that I'm not going to like jump on it and take care of business right away. I'll probably tell them, oh, here's the mirror, buddy, in a nice way. But if they're in trouble, they'll come to me because they know that I'm gentle and I'm going to deal with them in love. So what, <laughs> though, you know, that's how that works in my day. Am I lying? Okay. Um, all right. God is not a nitpicker. 
monkeys are. God is not. He's not a monkey. Have you seen that before? They're like picking their kids. Legalism condemns people. Love heals them. The devil installed things into you before you got saved. He's banking on these things to take you out now. There are your emotional attachments. We're to know our weakness and fortify. We don't ignore it and pretend it's not there. That's not going to make it go away. We inspect ourselves and find out what demons are hindering us and get rid of them. And ask for help if you need it. Do not be ashamed. It's your responsibility. I have asked for prayer when I'm struggling with things. I've had to, you know, re-ask for deliverance more than once. It doesn't mean I'm like falling apart and everything's crumbling, but I know there's a lot of stuff coming against me. I need someone to help me pray and get rid of it because it's a, I'm an eternal being. It's continual forever. It's not getting delivered six years ago or seven years ago is not like sufficient for the rest of my life. I, as the rest of us, we face a lot of trials and tribulations and crap happens in our lives. That sucks. And it, it, it wears on you. It wears on you. You get weak and weary and you need help, but you can't just ignore it or it's just going to keep growing and growing. Um, in Luke eleven twenty four, this is, you know, a lot of people have like this story about this beautiful scripture that God spoke to them when he led them to him and wooed them and la di da But for me and the way that my life was, he kind of had to like, get hello. So the scripture that really spoke to me and made me understand the beginning of understanding what was going on in my world was Luke 11.24. says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they, than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So if you don't keep your house filled and swept and in order, which means when it gets messy with demonic presence or ought or unforgiveness or bitterness, you got to clean it up, sweep it out, or you're going to get seven times more mess than you had in the first place. As Holy Ghost warriors, we find the devil's strategies and we use them against him. If he sends seven more demons to attack us when we get free, then we need to pray and fight ten times harder to keep them out. And then, I told you I'm almost done. One more scripture and I'm done. This is Romans 12.9. Now, when the first time I read this, I wasn't very happy. <laughs> I was like, what the heck? Are you serious? I don't, like my kid says, like, I don't want it. No. Where are you? I can't find it. I have it here. Ready? Not the, the behave like a Christian part. Of course, you want to behave like a Christian, but the actual instructions in here that seem totally against what your instincts are. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate toward one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in, in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, giving to hospitality, Bless those, this is the part I don't like. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. 
Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if you're at this is the part I don't like. <laughs> if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing you, you will in so doing you will reap heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I promise you that that works. If you overcome evil with good or overcome evil with love, God will work on your behalf. He will fight for you. He will take care of whatever it is and it will work to his glory because you love him and you're obeying him. And these are the contending in the flesh and trying to make and force change in other people and all of those things that our carnal nature wants to do does not work. But in fact, the opposite, you're overcoming evil with good or with love. And that is how you deal with your demons. Amen? Yay. Father, we come to you again in the name of Jesus, thanking you for your word, thanking you for your truth, thanking you for the seat you've granted us here at this ministry. Help us to value it. Help us to see it for what it is. Help us to deal with our demons, Lord. I bind every power of darkness coming against us right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. I lift up everyone who's holding on to any ought or unforgiveness or bitterness or offense or who's not understanding or doing well with dealing with their demons, Lord. And I just ask that you would help them. I take my authority and I bind all of these things and command it to loose and leave the people of God. And I just ask you, Lord, that you would give them eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive, follow, and obey you. I ask that your conviction would be loud, your voice would be loud, and that you would fill them with courage and boldness to take hold of what you've granted them here and apply it to their lives, Lord. Cleanse their hearts. Cleanse all of our hearts. Help us be righteous and right with you. Above all else, help us to love you above all else. And help us to take it serious why we're here so we don't go back to where we came from. We love you and we give you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.